holding it down on this beautiful Saturday morning. <laughs> man, no doubt. Early, uh, I got my cup of coffee right here. I'm ready to rock and roll. Yeah, I went and grabbed breakfast and everything. I like, man, I gotta get ready for my man's. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we're the greats in the building, my brother. That boy bad. That boy right there. Yeah, bad. Is. All right, we're gonna jump right into it here. Growing up, yeah. Growing up, what was your musical inspirations that that just made you kind of gravitate towards music? Well, you know me. I was born in in '67, so all all through that time in the '70s. Come on, I got a young mom's. You know, she was listening to all of the Motown movement and the Temptations and all that great music was always vibing, you know what I mean? And um, like even my grandmoms, like on the weekends, this is when neighborhoods were neighborhoods because your neighbors were your neighbors, you know what I mean? The neighbors, right. everybody was family. So Saturdays, my grandmoms would have the neighbors from the block, they'd be playing poker. You know what I'm saying? Poker, drinking their beer, the music playing, and I'm a little kid around all of this. But then in right. 1979, brother, my man D Money came from Harlem, and he used to stay with his grandmother next door to uh -huh. where I grew up, and he came with that damn hip hop tape in 79, 80. It was off to the races after that. <laughs> what? That was the first time I heard it, man. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, that's what I want to do. Off to the races. Yeah, that, that, that was it. It, it, it had you hooked. Yep, so so at what point did you start transforming into the hip-hop culture? Like, 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 when did you start pursuing it? Immediately. Immediately. When he let us hear the tape. See, this is how it went down. We were young. You know what I'm saying? We wasn't we wasn't really off the off the stoop yet, as they would say nowadays. We were still on the steps. We wasn't outside like that. You know what I mean? So right. I, I was definitely 12, 12 years old. This was before Sugar Hill Gang came out with uh uh Rapper's Delight and all of that. So we were still fresh. We didn't we didn't know what hip hop was, we didn't know what rapping was, we didn't know about the DJing and all of that, what was going on uptown, because we was all the way in Queens, you know what I mean? But D Money's what? brother, Mike, he's older than us. So he was at those functions out there. But we didn't hang with his brother because we were too young. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. D Money, he used to dip. And that's how he got that tape. He used to dip on his brother's cassettes and all of that. Okay. And we was we were sitting on his grandmother's steps and he played. I never forget. I think it was Grandmaster Kaz, man, because Kaz said a rhyme about a girl named Yvette. So when I heard him spit that, that's what got me. So immediately after, you know, we listened to this tape and all of that, I went back next door, got a pen, a paper, and I started writing. My first rhyme was a rhyme about a girl named Kim, which I emulated off of Kaz's Yvette. But, you know, I put my own twist and, and, and used right. his blueprint. Believe it or not, the first person that heard that rhyme was my grandmother. Now, mind you, see, back then, I didn't know my grandmother was white. I always thought she was light-skinned. Ain't nobody tell me nothing until I found out through <laughs> ancestry, all right? I thought she was light-skinned all this time. But anyway, um, so she was the first person that I spit that rhyme to, and, and mm. she loved it. You know, I didn't curse her, none of that, but she loved it, and that, that was... Once I got that co-sign from her, that's all I wanted to do was rap, 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 rap. So it was right then and there. It was on. Wow, that that that's incredible. Now, now, at what point did you decide that um you wanted to make it a career? Like, all right, I want to, I really want to do this, do this, not just be hanging out, do this, but this is something I really want to pursue. To be honest with you. I never planned for it to be a career. Everything that's happening for me now and everything that happened for me then exceeded my expectations of what I wanted. All I wanted to do, and anybody that knows me can tell you, 
All I wanted to do at that particular time was be the baddest MC in my neighborhood, Laurelton, Queens. That's all I wanted. I wanted, yo, we had groups around the way, man, that were, that were, that were very popular. They were the equivalent of uh, Cold Crush and Treacherous Three up, up, you know, in Manhattan and the Bronx. We had Rappomatical Five. Dope. They were like the Temptations. We had fucking, excuse my language, we had the Clientel Brothers. These brothers was like the four tops. You know what I mean? Street cred. All I wanted to do was be in those categories. And I wanted to be the baddest rapper out there. You know what I mean? And yeah. like I said, I exceeded that. I never planned for it to be a career. You know what I mean? But I, I still do it because now it's my therapy. Anything that comes with it is just a blessing, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, now, when did you start hitting the studio and, and actually recording and dropping? First studio I hit was... Um, first studio... Now, mind you, see, I come from the era of making cassette tapes, and we used to be in Johnny Quest's Sun Porch, and the first place we were, my man Damore, David Moore, my very first friend coming up. I was, as soon as I came outside, Dave Moore lived across the street. He was the first person I met. But, you know, when the, when the music thing started coming into play, David Moore got two turntables. He got <clears throat> two pioneers and shit. He had the old school turntables with the arm on it and all of that, you know what I mean? But <laughs> he made it work. So myself, the same brother D Money that I told you about, and my man Boo, we started a group called the Grandmaster Three, and Johnny Quest was our DJ. He called himself Slick C. So we used to make cassette tapes in um, David Moore's crib, you know what I mean? And then we eventually started going down the block to Johnny Quest's crib because his brother Buddy gave him some equipment one Christmas, and he had now he got some techniques and like some equipment equipment. So before Wu-Tang was even thought about, we had a crew called the LA Rap Masters, Laurelton Rap Masters. It was like 12 of us. And we used to hang out in Johnny Quest's crib and make cassette tapes. Now, as far as recording in a studio, the first demo that we made in a studio was in Laurelton with one of the members of Rappermatical Five. His name was Mellow Goo. And mm. Johnny Quest and my, he had a four track upstairs in the crib. I'll never forget. He lived next to a church on 228th and 135th. And we did our first demo there. The name of the demo was Here's Johnny. And that demo circulated throughout Queens. And that put us on the map. That one cassette. And that was also our first experience in a studio. Wow. So so tell me at that time, what was the the the, the hip hop environment like in Queens? The hip hop environment in Queens was it was basically like I said, <clears throat> I wasn't really out there out there at the time. So I was only really familiar with the cats that was you know, from Laurelton and like my cousin, Les Love. This is before, well, he's my cousin through marriage because he married my first cousin, Karen, eventually, you know what I mean? But prior to him marrying my cousin, Les Love was down with a group called the Romantic Lovers. And he also used to box, you know what I mean? So he had a lot of connections and he used to throw these, these, um, these jams at, we used to have this place in, on Springfield Boulevard called the Racket Club. It was a tennis court. And he used to bring people like Cold Crush, Funky Four, and all of them. And he would also have the local talent on the, um, on the card, like the Clientel Brothers and Rapper Medical. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we were growing up on. Because remember, I'm 12, 13 years old. You know, between 12 and, let's say, 15 years old, we were young. And um, everybody that I hung out with, like my man Mark Miller, me and him used to really hang tight. So we were the most, uh, what you would call, uh, competitive, you know, because everybody else wanted to dress alike and, and do these harmonizing routines and all of that. But Mark and I, we had that Kumo D, Grandmaster Kaz battle instinct. So we wanted to compete. We wanted to be 
we wanted to take your head off with the rhymes, you know what I'm saying? So that's yeah. basically what it was. We were just young kids looking up to those that, that were really out there doing it. So Queens wasn't really on the map at the time, you know. We were quiet. We was quiet. They used to call us Quack Quack Queens. I'll never forget y'all mother efforts for that. But we, we coming. Yes, you certainly did. You certainly did. All right, so you, you're doing that for a while. What was the turning point or, that you realized we can actually do something? Or, or how was that brought to you that you can actually have a career in music? See, again, I never considered it a career. I considered it a, a not even a hobby. I considered it a, a, a part of my life. I considered it as literally my culture. I never looked at yeah. it as a career. I never thought about the, the you know, the, the, the money. I wanted, I wanted the popularity and the respect. That's all I wanted. Yeah. I wanted that respect. I wanted people to look at me, know who I was, and know what I'm capable of. You know what I'm saying? Because I had a disadvantage in school and all of that because I was, number one, I was light-skinned. Number two, I had green eyes. Number three, I was pigeon-toed. And number four, I had curly hair. So I was a punk to, to people. I was bullied and stuff like that. You know what I mean? But hip-hop gave me a voice. That's where I found my niche, you know what I mean? So the turning point when business started coming into play was Eddie OJ, Will Seville, these are the guys that I, they, when you see Mikey D, um, everything I am today is basically a result of Eddie OJ and Will Seville. I have the whole Eddie OJ swag, you know, just the super cool motherfucker. And I have that lyrical wit and content and everything else of like Will Seville, because he's a beast. OJ is dope too. But Will Seville is just the cadence and all of that, you know. But anyway, those two combined is what you get today. But these guys are my big brothers and mentors to this day. Long story short, I'm sorry to go into that, but I had to give no, them um, we, we, uh, they, they, they was like, yo, we're going to this guy named Paul C's house. Now, Paul C, he wasn't on the map yet. You know what I mean? So remember we live in Laurelton, Paul C lived in Rosedale, the next town over. So, excuse me, we walked to Paul C's crib. Now, this guy had a studio in his garage. When we got to the corner of his block, Heard the music, playing the beats. I was like, oh, oh. So we, we go back there. Johnny Quest was with us too. Paul C comes out. Guess what? He was a white boy. Blew my mind, B. Because the Beastie Boys wasn't out yet. You know what I'm saying? The Beastie Boys wasn't out. So I was unfamiliar with white people, no offense, but being so familiar with hip hop. Remember, my Nana was the first person I heard my rhyme. She happened to be white. I didn't know it then. I thought she was light skinned. But Paul C was a white dude and he had so much soul. And when you saw him and you heard his music, you wouldn't be able to put the two together because Paul C looked like this humble, quiet, geeky type of white dude. But his music yeah. was incredible. So. After us meeting Paul C, it was off to the races because Paul C started inviting Johnny Quest and myself back to his crib to make cassettes and all of that. And it was on and popping. So what happened is Crush Groove. Crush Groove was being filmed or something. Am I skipping something? I remember Crush Groove being filmed and me and my man Lionel went down there to be extras or whatever, but... You know, we never made it inside where they were filming because I was outside battling and, and spitting bars and all of that. You know what I'm saying? So I missed my calling with the acting, you know, but a brother named Dr. Shock, my man, Michael Thomas, Dr. Shock. And this is when I met my man, Travis Jacobs, too. But my man, Dr. Shock was like, yo, y'all are dope. I know a manager, blah, 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 you know, and um, I gave him a tape. I gave him one of our tapes. He gave the tape to his manager. The manager, his name is Arthur Armstrong. 
see now back then I didn't know Arthur Armstrong owned a spot called the the Ecstasy Garage or whatever up in the Bronx, and he used to book all of the big acts from from there, Cold Crush and Fantastic Five and all of them. I didn't know that then, but he came to Queens to meet me, and after that, it was off to the races. I had a manager now, you know what I mean? And and Armstrong had some plugs, and see, back then, I used to do parodies. I used to uh, I used to take people's records, like, let's say, T. Rock, for instance, it's yours, I did a joint called Your Drawers, you know, and, and lyrically, <laughs> I would just flip the words around but make it funny. Yeah. Like I was the Weird Al before Weird Al. You know what I mean? So Armstrong mm. had a partner named Jerry Bloodrock. Jerry Bloodrock owned Reality Records. So Jerry Bloodrock at the time put the, the record, the hit record, Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick, the show out. And this is when people were making answers to everything. He thought it would be a great idea if the parrot the, the the answer record came out on his label so they wanted me to write a parody of the show for some girls so i wrote it for the symbolic three they came out with a record called no show but they came out at the same time as super super nature that super nature was then uh, super nature was salt and pepper before salt and pepper but they were that was the okay. name of it and they came right. out with um song at the same exact time you know but um that's what started me on the business journey in hip hop and so now you you're kind of reaping the benefits how how is that just making you feel like like what was going through your mind like 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 how was you processing all this it was it was amazing to to, to hear the stuff on the radio you know um Unfortunately, I didn't know the business because I had a manager before I had a lawyer. So not to say that my manager was jerking me or anything like that, but the money wasn't being distributed the way it should be distributed. Um, nobody informed me about publishers' royalties. Nobody informed me about writers' royalties at this particular time. When you signed a contract with a label, they would take 100% of the publishing. You know, you really didn't see no money. The only money that I was getting, and it, it was an incredible journey, was traveling and, and doing these live shows. That's when I was seeing it. And even still, still then, I wasn't considering myself as a, uh, as a, uh, a business artist. I was considering myself as a dope MC because at every show, I just wanted to rhyme. Up doing the dance steps. Forget all of the planned stuff. Let's be spontaneous and let's do whatever on the spot. Like we're doing the street. That was my whole thing. So I was just doing what I love on a higher level. Right, right. So, cool so Rock, tell me about your first building, legendary Fat Boys, baby. Holla! Oh, Lord. big ups, big ups, man. We're gonna have to get with you. Now, now tell me when you first started touring. Tell, tell me about. You know that that whole touring process, you you hitting the road with it. Yeah, well, we we hit the road with with the record, no show. That's with the symbolic three. You know what I mean, three girls. You know, it was crazy, man. You know, cause uh, Doctor Shock and myself, we the we the two guys. You know, we got three girls. You know, women women are women. You know what I mean. And <laughs> at the time, I was dealing with one of the girls. You know, I ain't gonna say her name, but you know. Her moms, I love her moms. Her moms was our road manager. So we got all these girls around, you know what I'm saying? Girl, do girls thing. But the experience itself was incredible. The love that people had for us. And, you know, I, I rocked at stadiums with LL Cool J, you know what I'm saying? And oh, I met Egyptian lover. And, yo, know, we was on the road with Bobby Brown was on the bus with us one time and the real rock stand and, Yo, it, it was crazy, man. And and like I said, all I did was I always had to get away from the actual show and, and do what I do to let the people know. Turn that music off or or give me a beat. Let me get busy. You know what I'm saying? So that's how yeah. that was. But yeah, traveling, man, that was the greatest experience ever. Had had you had you been outside of New York too much prior to that? Prior to that, we were 
I was I was a, a hood legend. Then I became a borough urban myth. Like my name was known, ringing bells. People heard of the stuff that I was doing, but couldn't believe it and never met me. And then when they saw me, it was like, ain't no way this little skinny dude got that voice and that heart, you know? And basically prior to traveling, we were definitely tri-state. Connecticut, we rocked all over Connecticut, all over Jersey. And excuse me, that coffee, and New York. So, yeah, we would just try state, you know? Wow. So so, so, what's the first um, out-of-state show outside the tri-state area you had performed at? It, it, it might have been, been in Baltimore. We did our, uh, and this is when Go-Go was really big, you know what I'm saying? So we did a, we did a, a big roller skating rink out in Baltimore. So that was that was lit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that was lit. It was Baltimore, and then Virginia, you know, and then we started going further south. Yeah, that, that was up. Now look, now looking at hip hop from where it was to where it is, what what has been your take on the landscape overall of hip hop? Yo, let me tell you, I'm I'm gonna be honest. There's a big generation gap. There's a lack of respect, and um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame the young artists for this lack of respect. I gotta put some blame on, you know, myself, not myself to say, but some of the the the, the elders of this game. Because remember, once I was once young, so I had to deal with the elders, and they didn't want to let it go. Instead of taking the young cats under their wing and, and putting them on, they want to hold on to it. Instead of acting like we're the children of them, they wanted to act like we're their competition. You know what I mean? So they want to yeah. act like the kids was the liabilities. When we all we're doing is elevating what you started. But they didn't want to give us yeah. that respect. So that trickled down all the way. You know what I'm saying? I love the elders. I love the elders, but y'all let us down. You know what I'm saying? And now a lot of these cats got the nerve to frown down on these young kids because they doing what they do. But instead of criticizing them, offer them some, 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 some guidance. That's why I call myself an OG, because I offer yeah. guidance. You know what I'm saying? These dudes wanted to hold on to it like, yo, this is ours. You ain't supposed to be. Just like they did Queens, man. All right, we know it started in the Bronx. Bronx created it for Queens, elevated it. Point blank, simple. All right? So it is what it is, man. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, we we allow corporate to, to, to get a hand in there and just take control of yeah. everything. You know what I'm saying? They're selling debt now. I mean, there was a point where we um we had music that that elevated the the, the mentality and 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 made you proud to be who you are. You know what I'm saying? And they shut that down and brought all of the gangster rap in. Not to take away from their talent, the guys that were spitting the gangster rap and killing each other were very talented, but they capitalized off of the violence. You know what I'm saying? So they could monetize the deaths, they could monetize the jails, and all of that. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing exists yeah. today. And today is so crazy because I swear, if we had this internet like these younger artists have, man, we would have been super lit back then. You know, but again, corporate has found a way to infiltrate. First of all, they infiltrated with the streaming. They cut our money very short. You know what I'm saying? With this stream and stuff, opposed to actual record sales and stuff like that. You know what I mean? But they're capitalizing off of death and murder and all of that. And then these people, these these young cats don't know no better. You know, they, they, I think the labels are cashing in on their life insurance policies, to be honest. I believe that as well. I, I you know, believe that. So, you, man, you got to follow the money trail. Yo, I, I got... I got um, I got a lot of confidence and faith in the younger generation. You know, everything everything goes in a circle. You know what I mean? I'm getting older now. 
you know what I mean? But see, my thing, my my purpose right now is to um, is to is to inspire and motivate my peers of our age group, and to also educate the younger generation without telling them what to do, but schooling them not to make the same mistakes that I made. You know what I mean? Because I love everybody. I swear to God, if my heart was my bank account, I would be wealthy. You heard? But it is what it is, man. That's how I feel about it today. Yeah, because I, I think the youth, like you say, it's not so much as telling them what to do, but just kind of showing them like, hey, here's something to look at. Here's something to consider. You know what I'm yeah, saying? We, we, we got to put it out yeah, you gotta be respectful of it. You gotta lead by example. And if you want respect, you gotta give respect. You gotta remember the younger generation, these are our children, man. These are our kids, man. My daughter is 33 years old. I had her rapping when she was three. You know, she don't rap now, but she um she does hair and she's very successful at it. But what I'm saying is these artists that are coming out now. Now I could be their, some of their grandfathers, man. But I got to look at them as my kids because hip-hop hip -hop is our village, man. You heard? Yeah. It is what it is, man. Um, that's all I can say. And I do this shit because I love it, man. I do it because I love it. I don't look for a check, but if a check comes, then it's a yeah. blessing. But I do this because I love it, not because I have to or none of that. People be like, yo, what? I be at work sometime and... and People don't really know who I am, but then when they find out and they start Googling, they be like, why are you here? I'm like, because I got to pay bills. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, and honestly, let, let me interject on that. That's why I have so much respect for you. Because you're, as a man, you're doing what it takes to handle your business and take care of your family. And a lot of people, they don't really get that. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't really understand that concept. Like, yeah, you know, you, you could have been in music and all that, but there's still life, and you're still full of life, and, and music is an art, and you can always go in your studio and paint your art anytime you want to because you're still an artist. And I think people have become so business-minded that they, they lose sight of the artistry. That's a fact. I see... I, I, I take my craft and, and, and hip hop as therapy. When I'm feeling down, I write and I feel better. You know what I mean? When I'm angry, I write and I feel better. You know, and technology is so useful nowadays. I bought a studio, right? I had a, I had all of the big stuff and it was cluttered. And But then I, I, I bought this thing called the Isotope Spire Studio. Fits in a little bag. And I could go, I could record from anywhere on the planet. People could call me, send me the music. I could download it into the Spire and get busy right then and there. Spire's about yeah. this big. Studio is like this. You know what I mean? So, you know, it is what it is, man. Maybe, sure. yo, and this is something else people got to remember, especially the younger artists. There's enough room for all of us. And you got to remember, not everybody is going to become a superstar. See, with me, I might have superstar qualities, but my purpose may have been to inspire somebody to become a superstar, to use my blueprint as the stepping stone to elevate to that level. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The Most High puts yeah. us here for different purposes. You might be trying so hard to become the superstar and get frustrated because you're not it, but somebody else can take your blueprint and win. And that's still you, man, regardless. Yeah. You heard? So that's how I look at it. You're 100% correct, which is why I like getting you guys stories out here. Like I tell people, I have a good job and, and I make pretty good money. I, I live good. But this, I'm a hip-hop head. I'm a fan. I love the history. And we have to quit letting other people with, with, with not good intention tell our history because we see what happens when that, when they tell our history we see what happens right right yep. right that's that's facts man that's facts and they have to stop erasing some of this history too man because i i just i look at stories because i lived it you know what i'm saying i'm 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 day 
I would say I'm day three of hip hop. You know, our pioneers, they're the foundation. The first floor is that wave of rappers that came right after that. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the second floor, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, I watched the shit from the beginning to where it is now, and I notice a lot of the stories are being changed around, and they're erasing certain parts of history. Man, I Google myself, and I be like, hmm. They forgot about that, huh? Hmm. Oh, they added this? That's not true. That's not accurate. So, yeah, we got to be real careful, man. Got to tell our story. And Yo, Geechee Dan, I see you, baby. And I always tell people, we have to tell the whole story. You cannot pick, choose, have your favorite parts, but you have to tell the whole story so these kids have full understanding. You know what I'm saying? And and then I think that's where the res respect to come because, like you said, you know, back in the day, cats Kat, just wanted to be heard on the radio and be be the dopest on their block. Like, hey, I'll chop your head off with these lyrics. Yeah, it is, man. I still do. <laughs> yeah, facts. <laughs> that's a fact, man. You know what? That's why, that's why Grandmaster Vic and me started this movement called Kings from Queens, man. Because that's another thing about this hip hop thing that people try to erase. Like I said earlier, the Bronx created it, Queens elevated it, man. Some of the most successful rappers come from Queens. So how are we gonna celebrate 50 years of hip hop and y'all ain't talking about Queens, man? That's why we here, man. I'm putting my, I carry my ball on my back. I've been carrying yeah. it for 40 years plus. So watch and, how we move, man. Watch how we move. And 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 the Queen's the legacy. The Bronx, so don't get it twisted, huh? Yeah. But that that Queen's legacy is very rich. It, it's very rich. They don't understand. <laughs> they don't understand. They better start. Getting, I, they better start showing my brother Grandmaster Vic some respect. I know that. Yo, yo, yeah. Y'all, everybody that's here right now. Y'all got to show Grandmaster Big some respect. He is the creator of the blends. I don't care what Kid Capri is doing. I don't care what Duop is doing. I got love for them brothers. But when it comes to the blends, Grandmaster Big created it. Show him some love. Man, t t tell me what that was like. Because, you know, that I know that had to be a rare thing. Like, like what, what even possessed him to even go that route? as far as coming up with the blends like that? Brother, I couldn't even tell you, man. I couldn't even tell you. I don't know what the hell Vic was thinking about when he did that, but he did it. But see, you got to remember, I was on one side of Queens. He was on the south side of Queens. So when I met Vic, he was already doing it. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking 40 years ago, man. Plus, you heard? That's where that Queens sound comes from, man. South Jamaica. You heard? He was doing the rising to the top. Coach Cheeks and all of them out there, Spank G, you know, Rat Monkey and all of them in the in, in, in 40 Park, IS8, you know. But yo, and if you think about it, I think P. Diddy studied Grandmaster Vic's blueprint because. When Mary J first came out, that whole sound was Grandmaster Vic blend. Yeah. So yeah, mm. Grandmaster Vic, I'm telling you, man, they got to stop forgetting Grandmaster Vic. I mean, Nas shouted him out. That wasn't enough. I mean, 50 Cent always shouts him out. That ain't enough. What we got to do? Yeah, I know what we got to do. We got to show y'all Kings from Queens, and we going to show y'all. I'm putting it out there. I'm putting it out there. We're going to show y'all. Watch. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> hey, I, I need you. Hey, plug me in. No. Man, let me tell you. Vic probably emailing me right now. I got about 700 and something blends from this, brother. I really think we need to have like a, a rising to the top radio station. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. Grandmaster Vic don't like to talk. He talked with his hands. He don't like to okay. be like what we doing right here. He would, yo, he would come out of the garbage can like Oscar the Grouch. What y'all want? 
I'm working. And he'll go back <laughs> in there and come with the guns. That, yo, Grandmaster Victor Grouch, man. You know what I'm saying? But he's the dopest, the most talented DJ that I know. And um, I'm telling you, I really, I'm putting this in the universe. We need a rising to the top radio show. DJ Grandmaster Vic. I'll host it. I'll host it. Word. Yeah, that that would be man. dope. Especially like right now, because like Shout you said, we, we got this. <laughs> you know, especially like right now, because this internet, you can reach everybody now. You you don't really you don't need permission. Yeah, that's that's a fact. That's definitely so, a fact. Yeah. So I mean we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work on it, man. And um hopefully, you know, we'll shed some light on Grandmaster Vic and um bring some new life to him in this era. Because see what it is, the reason Vic and I um got reconnected in the first place with this Kings from Queens thing is because okay, for instance, we're about to celebrate 50, they say fifty years of, of hip hop, right? Well, why is it that no one talks about the Park Jam era? Why do they just skip right over the Park Jam era like the Park Jam era wasn't the blueprint of the stages? Like, you had to pay dues by coming outside. You know, like yeah. Picasso in the building, my brother, MC Lotto, he know what I'm talking about. Everybody had to hit the Park Jam circuit first. I mean, this is right after the cassettes. You know what I mean? And, and during the cassette time, but if you wanted to hit the stage, you had to be that dude that could get behind the ropes at the pop jams. Why do we forget about the pop jam era? Well, that's why Grandmaster Vic and I are here now. I don't care because talent, you can't put a cap on talent. We're going to be talented for the rest of our lives, and we're going to do what it is that we love doing regardless of who likes it and who doesn't. You can say it's old. If it's old to you, then go over there to something new. But you got people like us that love what we love, and we represent y'all. So what we have to do is bring the Park Jam era. We're not bringing it back. We're bringing it to the forefront to let people know yeah. what that sound is all about because that is the sound that's missing today us having fun, being able to dance. And the only time we were at a party like this, looking like this, is when we was looking at that girl that we want to dance with. We wasn't looking <laughs> at another brother like, I like his shoes. We wasn't doing that. We was like this in a B-boy stance, looking at the girl we wanted to pull to the side and dance with. You heard? So that's the music that Vic and I are bringing to the forefront, man. Kings from Queens, Park Jam Legends. That's that's what's up. Like you said, bring it to the forefront. Br bring that feel good back. I, I think just as a culture and as a people, we got to get that feel good music circulating again. That's where that's where that's where it came from, man. Love, peace, and happiness, man. Bada and them said it best. I don't care about all of the rumors and all of that. Love, peace, and happiness, man. Look. Mr. Chicks and them said it too. They said love, peace, and happiness. But it, that's yeah. where it came from. And their music yeah. felt good and they danced and they, you know what I'm saying? That's what we need, man. We need that stuff like, yo, look, Grandmaster Vic and I talk all the time and he made an excellent point, man. People always glorify Fat Cat and, and Supreme. And in in, in like they glorify the negative gangsters, this, that, and other. They never talk about the good that they did in the community. Like, you know, having these parties and buying all of the kids ice cream and buying all of the kids t shirts. And if they didn't have sneakers and stuff like that, they never celebrate the good. And see, Grandmaster Vic was a DJ that was DJing at all of their parties. And just because there was gangsters at their parties, there were never shootouts. It was only love, peace, and happiness, man. So we celebrate that, man. And we're coming up on 50 years of hip hop. So let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate the positive, man. You heard? If, if, if you could do a projection, what do you see for the next 10 years of hip hop? Or what would you like to see in the next well, 10 years of I just would like to see elevation and growth in a, in, in a positive direction. I, I want to see people have fun with it. And I want, I want, I want the, um, 
the competitive nature to be there. You know what I mean? But not not disrespectful where you you know you go in the graves and kicking over headstones and all that bullshit. But bring the skills back. I understand today's music, a lot of it is not about being lyrical. I understand it's more about the vibe. That's why you know the 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 um the sonic uh you know that you know what I'm talking about that sonic yeah, yeah, the, exactly sonically so. it, it, it it's it's it hypnotizes you know what I'm saying so we need to we need to challenge you breaking up for a second. Yo, we back. We back. Yeah, yeah, we back. Go ahead. Yeah, somebody tried to call. I got it on Do Not Disturb. Yeah, I just want to see. I want to see some 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 more talent. You know what I mean? Because like I said, I understand the music today is it's about a vibe. Nobody want to go and hear a bunch of rapping. They want to. They, they no. They they want to be able to nod their head. We got to bring that music back sonically. That makes you want to move your body, baby, and dance and have a good time. How about this? I I feel like hip hop right now in this day and age has actually went back to its essence to where you had to find it because I do find a lot of young cats who are lyrical and who's really doing real good hip hop music they're just not popular. You know what I'm saying? Like like I see some of these sponsored pages yeah. and, and some of these guys, I'm like, these are the guys that, that sh I ain't going to say, it, it just need to balance out. If, if, if we yeah. can have balance. But what we have to do is we have to bridge that gap, that generational gap, and we have to look at each other as fathers, mothers of this hip hop culture. We have to look at our younger generation as our nephews, our nieces, our sons, our daughters, even our grandchildren. And we have to help elevate one another. And respect is a mutual thing. City the Great know what I'm talking about. See, this is what I'm talking yeah. about. Like City the Great, he's a young up and coming artist that is super dope. My man Cool Rock Ski from the Fat Boys took him under his wing and gave him that cosign. That's what I'm talking about, generation gap. I got a young brother named Razor. Razor is young and he's from the Bronx and I'm from Queens. He's co-signed by me. He's co-signed by Grandmaster Cass. When Lotto was young, I co-signed him. When I was young, Eddie OJ co-signed me. We need more of that. We don't have to keep competing with one another. We need to get together and take this back, man. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I agree with you 100% because I, I deal with a lot, of, a lot of young guys that that's you know here in Ohio that's trying to do their music thing, and I tell them like first of all, start your do some research, understand what you're getting into, understand what I, you're getting into, I, so so you get it. I'm like I ain't saying you gotta change up what you do, but have an understanding of what you're getting into, you know, because it, it's like you you have people who call themselves being in hip hop. But they don't like R&B music. How, how can that be so? <laughs> well, maybe they're just maybe they just biased to hip hop. I mean, you know, see a lot. See the, the younger artists. All they listen to is hip hop. All their parents listen to is hip hop. Yeah. See what I'm saying? They're not as fortunate as us to have a variety of different sounds growing up. Because remember, I, I was here before hip hop existed, so I was already listening to other music. Gospel, yeah. you know, it moves my spirit sometimes. You know what I mean when I listen to it. Um, you know, I never really got into rock and roll, but country, country has a vibe. You know, yeah. and this, and the songwriting. You know, R and B, man, uh, jazz, and so I, I grew up in that element. You heard? Because that's yeah. what my parents listened to. We didn't have hip hop. I'm the first generation of hip hop in my family. No, nope. matter of fact, I'm the second generation of hip hop in my family because my cousin Karen was she was married or no, she had a kid by DJ Woody Wood out of Queens, man. Woody Wood. Ha! R.I.P. I forgot about that, Karen. I had to blow her up real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but 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 you're right, man. If we just 
keep working with the kids and, and, and just, just be there for them. You just got to be there for them. Yeah, and, 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 we, and, we need, and we need brothers like you to continue to tell your story, especially with the passion and love that you have for the, for the hip hop culture. Cause I, I can just tell you, you, you have a love and a passion that's undeniable. And, and, and I salute you for that. Much respect, man. Yeah, I live it. I breathe it. I mean, it's me. This hip hop literally raised me from a 12 year old kid, pigeon toes, snot nose, to a 55 year old responsible adult. And hip hop is still my number one love, man. It's my therapy, it's, it's, it's everything. You know what I'm saying? I live it, I breathe it, I walk it, I talk it, man. Yes, yeah, sir, you like to say, man, we, we gotta get these stories out here and, and, and talk about these guys that need to be talked about more so, so they're not overlooked, especially when, you know, people such as yourself, your blueprint is on, a, you know, your fingerprint rather is on a lot of MC, especially from Queens, and you know what I'm saying? You you guys, man, y'all, you got to be heard. Especially, yeah, when I, especially when I know sometimes you sit back and be like, yeah, that's me. That's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, but 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 it makes me proud, I, I, you know, because right. I can say I contributed to that, you heard? I mean, it, it, you don't always have to get a pat on the back. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's cool to just look back and reflect. And when you see it, be like, yeah, I'm proud of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm proud. You heard? So, yeah, that's 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 what it is, man. That's what it is. You know, I ain't going nowhere, man. I got I got a few years left, man. So I'm I'm still going to get busy, and, and I'm just going to get better, B. You're not going to get that 17-year-old Mikey D no more. You're going to keep getting this Playboy Mikey D. You see, I had to bring my, my name back, right? Should I break that down yeah, yeah. real quick so they can understand? Let, let me let the people know, man. Let me let them know. Now, y'all, see, I changed my name to Playboy Mikey D. Now, Playboy Mikey D is not something new. When I started this journey in 79, 80, the first name that I adopted was Playboy Mikey D, all right? Then I changed my name to Mikey D and all of that, and I was still the only Mikey D at the time. There was no internet or none of that, so I'm Mikey D. Then I changed my name to Mikey D Struction because that came from a rhyme. That's when I was an angry rapper, and I wanted to take everybody's head off, so I destroyed other rappers. So that's where the Mikey D Struction came from. And then the real Mikey D is because of this internet thing. Now, when I Google Mikey D, I see a whole bunch of Mikey D's like, where the hell did this come from? You know? <laughs> so then I changed my name to the real Mikey D, but I felt cheated. I felt like if I'm the, if I'm the original and the real Mikey D, why do I have to prove it by having the title such as the real? So you know what I thought about? I said, why don't I revert back to the original name that I adopted, which was Playboy Mikey D. So here I am today. When you Google Playboy Mikey D, I am the only one you heard. And back then, Playboy was because I felt, you know, I was cute, conceited, and I could get any girl I wanted to. So I was a Playboy. And you got to remember, back then, we used the word playboy before we used the word player. Before we was calling each other's player and all of that, we was like, yo, what up, playboy? Right? Yeah, yeah. So today, yeah. playboy does not mean I can get every girl I want because I'm happily involved with my woman. Playboy is my swag. To, because if you know me, to know me, I'm a natural down to earth. I don't like to say humble. I let other people say that I'm humble. But I'm down to earth. And the way that I carry myself, that's what the Playboy represents. So there you have it, Playboy Mikey D. And I still, I still, I could go in my bedroom right now. I had a gold cap, right? On this, no, not on this one, on this tube, right? I had a gold um. cap 
from I was 15 years old, and it has a Playboy. But wait right here, wait right here. I'll be right back. <laughs> Oh man, you about to go get his gold cap. I swear, if there's a Playboy bunny on it, I'm gonna be in tears, man. I'm gonna be in tears. See what this dude come back with. <laughs> yes, man. I, I do want to thank everybody for chiming in though, man. I'm coming back. I appreciate y'all. Here I am. Check it out. I don't know if you can see it, but is the Playboy Bunny on here? <laughs> hey, I said, if this dude come back with a Playboy Bunny, I'm be in tears, man. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. So, this is the, this is the proof. It. This tooth is older than anybody out there that's calling themselves Playboy right now. A big Right here is the proof. Look at that Playboy bunny. I'm gonna I'm gonna donate this tooth to the hip hop uh museum. I have to. So Playboy Mikey D. Now I could probably get verified because I'm the only one. <laughs> I, I was telling him when you did, I like man, if he come back with a Playboy bunny on his tooth, I'm gonna be in tears. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. Boy, right there. Yo. This thing stayed in my mouth for 40 years, man, and, and I had the dental glue on. It was dental glue, so it was permanent, right? Yeah. One day, I was eating some Skittles, man. At, I was like maybe 53, and that sucker came out. I couldn't believe it. I was like, yo! See, this? it was hey. on this tooth. It preserved, look at that tooth. It preserved it. <laughs> See, this one, this is a dead tooth because I cracked it. Cracking Heineken bottles with, with my teeth and broke this damn tool. Hey, hey, you gotta put yeah. it in the Hip Hop Hall of Fame, man. Put that tooth in the Hip Hop Hall of Fame. <laughs> Already reached out to them, and, and I, told, I told Prime Minister Pete Nice and, and uh, Rocky and all of them over there that I got a gift for them. Playboy, baby, right there. So, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> That's beautiful. Hey, we're going to get ready to get up out of here. But before we go, man, you got any closing statements you want to hit us with, my brother? Yeah, absolutely. I, like, I, like I said before, um, there's enough room for all of us. Respect goes both ways. And remember, not everybody is going to come be, become a superstar. But don't let that discourage you from, from, from following your passion. You heard, uh, like I said, this, this, this talent, you can't put a cap on it. You know what I'm saying? Say it's over whenever. And, um, you know, just be yourself. Do it your way. And the number one thing to do before you listen to anybody else's advice, follow your own instincts because your instincts never steer you wrong, man. Much love. Word up. And don't forget to follow Kings from Queens, baby. Stay tuned. Grandmaster Vic and Mikey D. We bringing that punk jam era back, baby. We bringing it back. I know we're not bringing it back. We bringing it to the forefront. You dig? We're and, and, pushing and it up. Out, yo, and make sure y'all check out the, the little skits that I'll be doing. Park jam legend. I go to all of the parks where I used to rock at, and I spit a, a verse and, and keep it pushing, you know? So trust me, we just getting started. 55 years old. And I'm in my prime. You heard? I'm in my prime. I feel great. I have the, the proper resources now. You know, everything is independent. And yo, I'm 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 happy, man. I'm happy. I'm happy. I will take yo, you and another thing, you know, this is me. This might just be me. A lot of people chase the bag. I am the bag. You heard? A lot of people want to chase the bag. Don't chase the bag. Be the bag. So I know my worth already. So I'm not chasing a dollar. I ain't doing that. It's like this, man. All of the riches from monetary gain, you can't take that with you when you leave. But one thing you can take is that impression you left on everybody still here. You know what I'm saying? If they got love and respect for you, 
That's all energy, baby. And you can take that with you on your journey. Can't take this with you, man. So like I said, right here, if this was a bank account, I'd be wealthy. You dig? There it is. That's all I can say, y'all. Man, I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. For those who are not following me, follow Playboy Mikey D. Those who don't follow me, follow me. Hey, get behind me. And like I said, my podcast is a little different. We don't have viral moments, and we're not trying to stir the pot on nothing. We're trying to inspire and motivate. It might not be the most popular, but I do believe it is, it's the most effective. Absolutely. So, everybody, enjoy your Saturday. Watch some football. Do what you do. Mikey D, once again, I thank you. God bless you. And, man, I, I'm just going to call you and chop it up, man. You know how we do, bro. Yeah, no doubt. You already know, man. Yo, thank everybody for tuning in, man. Like I said, again, shout out to my man Cool Rob, Geechee Dan, Lot Picasso, City the Great, everybody that's in here. I love all of y'all, man. I can't wait. To, to see y'all in person. We gonna we all gonna run across each other. Grandmaster Vic, baby. I love you. Grandmaster Vic for president. He gonna come out of that garbage can and say, I don't wanna do it right now. <laughs> all right, y'all have a good one. Peace. Peace. <laughs>